This video is sponsored by War Thunder. Meet Benjamin Hornigold, a man who I can only assume really enjoyed his gold. Writing the final wave of the golden age of piracy, Hornigold's brief career left a dazzling legacy filled with everything from merchant jumping to pirate hunting. But as every college grad knows, it's not our good grades or accolades that leave an impact, but rather the stupid things we do while drunk on Thirsty Thursday behind a Taco Bell that people remember us for. And while Hornigold may not have lived long enough to enjoy the dreamlike enlightenment achieved from the bite of a beef quesarito, even still would he be remembered for a tale of drunken shenanigans. One night in 1717, Hornigold and his crew were partaking in a wee bit of rum guzzling, sword fumbling, plank stumbling buffoonery when they drunkenly threw their hats into the sea. But parting with a core piece of their identity for a quick laugh was a decision they'd quickly regret. This was a disaster, a tragedy, pirate problems in only two days, so what will all the other crews say? But luckily, as the sun came up the following morning, they spotted a merchant ship off the coast of Honduras and brewed up a plan. Yar! Ah, turn off the light, would ya? The, the sun. Whatever, just hand over your hats or plank the walk. Did you say hats? <laughs> Can a beaver hold its breath for 15 minutes? Uh, yes, the answer is yes. I just don't know that much about beavers. Forget it, it doesn't matter, just cough up the hats, sailor boy. And like, that's it? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Unless you got, like, White Castle or something? I, I don't know what that is. Me neither, it just sounds really good. As the terrified merchants prepared for the worst, Hornigold explained that they were quite literally only there for their hats after their drunken tobacco the night prior. After sticking to his word, the pirates sailed off, leaving the merchants without injury, beyond the shame of having lost their drip. Sensational tales like Hornigold's have spun him a legacy that survived to this day, but even still, he isn't remembered for being the greatest pirate of all time. After all, building a legacy through alcohol poisoning is only one step towards becoming a legend, Steve, and there are many ingredients needed to bake the Pirate King pie. So, without further ado, on today's episode, I'm going to teach you how to become the King of the Pirates. Alright Steve, the sun is high and the wind's blowing by, so let's make you do a proper pirate to make your flag fly. Oh, but first make sure to suck on a few limes before we go. As my grandmother always said, oh my god, dear lord, everything is pain, I can't stop bleeding. She had scurvy. Uh, putting a pin in that, but first, who are you and, and why are you talking? Well, normally I'd be talking to my other victim, Alex, but apparently he's in a psych ward due to acute psychological trauma or whatever. D did you say victim? Step one, becoming a pirate is the same as any other career. Motivation. Whether it's engineers and high salaries or Minecraft YouTubers and access to miners, every job needs a proper incentive. And while there were many reasons various scoundrels decided to fly the Jolly Roger, for the maritime pirates of the late 17th early 18th centuries, they can be narrowed down to primarily three motivations. Let's say you get kidnapped. <laughs> the sea is very big. It can fit a lot of ships, you see. These ships need hands to do the things on the ship to keep the ship being a ship on the sea, for all to see. But sometimes these hands don't want to be on the ship on the sea, for they see the degree to which they won't be free. Therefore, with glee, both pirates and navies agree, the key, regardless of plea, is a kidnapping spree. Pirates are good for many things. Loading cannon holes, digging treasure holes, making new holes, you name it. But what if they receive holes themselves? They can't fix it with yet another hole. They tried. So pirates would often find themselves in need of specialists like doctors and carpenters to perform the more expert work aboard a ship. However, specialists weren't typically the type to turn to piracy. You know, poor. Meaning pirates would have a difficult time recruiting someone like a doctor into their crew. Hey Billy, were you able to recruit that doctor fella? Nah, he's still thinking about it, but don't worry. I planted the seed in his mind. Did you now? Huh? Well, if he was a good doctor, you could have just taken it out. While recruiting skilled labor proved difficult, luckily there was a plethora of capable seamen out there on merchant ships just begging to be kidnapped. And as it turns out, recruiting new crewmen was much easier once you limited their options to either practice medicine as a pirate or practice medicine without thumbs. Okay, so yeah, of course the criminals do the crime things, but surely the Navy doesn't go around kidnapping people. <laughs> oh yes, Steve, your government loves you so very much. Especially when you listen. Impressment was the practice of forcing men via coercion, extortion, or various torsions into primarily the service of a navy. Carrying out this practice were the dreaded press gangs, groups of men who often frolicked about the docks of Britain, cudgels in hand, looking for the next unlucky bugger to beat and kidnap in the name of the king. While targets of this forced servitude were supposed to be seafaring men between 18 and 55 years old, those rules only applied to people, not the poors. So there were occasions where press gangs would just snag the random tiny Tim from the middle of the street. What were they gonna do? 
do? Write a letter of complaint? <laughs> they can't read. But with drastic tactics come drastic results, and many of these press sailors would end up mutinying or deserting their posts, thus turning to a life of piracy. But for you, we can rule out kidnapping seeing as you live far from the ocean in this disgusting place I can't even pronounce. Kentucky? Bless you. Moving on to option two, we have state-sponsored theft. Ah, I know this one. The IRS. No, Steve. We don't dare make fun of the IRS. I'm talking about privateering. Put simply, a privateer was essentially a pirate who was given the green light by a government to have a grand old time nabbing and stabbing foreign merchants. Any private citizen itching for the pirate life but without the balls to fully give the government the finger could acquire this permission via a letter of mark. A piece of paper that stated the little rascals currently assaulting and robbing you were doing so with the blessing of the king. Permission from the king, huh? <laughs> well that's a relief. Since privateers had a knack for damaging foreign economies, letters of mark were at their most popular during times of war, but once Foreign nations made peace and the letters were revoked, many former privateers were reluctant to throw away such a lucrative line of work. So ironically, the same nations who struggled combating piracy also fueled said piracy, as the former privateers would continue raiding ships, including those of their former state sponsors. These waves of piracy could be so dramatic in fact that once the War of Spanish Succession ended in 1714, it single-handedly brought about the third era of the golden age of piracy. <laughs> Wave of piracy, ocean waves, <laughs> that's kind of funny. Wow Steve, when the Netflix special. Anyway, as we already know, you're no privateer, so with the first two ruled out, it looks like we'll have to go with option three for you. Which is... Poverty. For the world's poor and disadvantaged, the pirate lifestyle served as a powerful motivator. They took my mom's ashes. You went from isolation to open freedom, from stick beating to stick wearing, from sleeping in shit to sleeping in shit but with hook hands. Meanwhile, a merchant or military vessel subjected you to low pay, terrible rations, and frequent physical punishment, and not the fun kind either. Compare that to the equality and freedom enjoyed by pirates in the pursuit of untold riches, and it's clear to see how some could find the swashbuckling path preferable. Welcome aboard, matey! You made the right choice joining this crew. In no time at all, you'll be swimming in all the golden women your little heart desire. Shiver me blunderbuss! It'd be a treasure galleon of the Spanish main! Oh my god! Man the- what the fuck did you just say? What? I'm just surprised. No, no, no. Did I actually just hear what you said just now? I'm just trying to be a little funny. Funny? <laughs> Explain to me what part of spewing TikTok brain rot in the middle of a conversation is funny. Um, I, I think this skit is supposed to be about finding riches. No, fuck the script. You really expect me to sit here while your Zoomer brain parasite vomits nonsense all over a social setting like a Kanye West interview? Uh, Charles, we're really trying to break into the younger demographic and encourage Mr. Blake here to improvise, so if you could just read your lines, that'd be great. I did not graduate from Juilliard to taint my reputation with such a sacrilegious performance, so you can find another headliner for your stupid skit. Um, so, so are we just, uh, done for the day? No, no, just give me five. Nick Cage will do it. Checking off motivation, your next step on your Pirate King journey is joining a crew. Just like with motivation, there are a lot of ways this could be done, but for the sake of time and to put you on the fast track to the top, we're gonna take you down the fun route. Uh, I don't know if I like your tone. Oh, don't you worry, Steve. This way, not only will you join a crew, but you also get a taste of the sweet ecstasy that comes from watching a man's soul leave his eyes as fresh blood paints your hands in sin. <laughs> So let's go start a mutiny. Mutinies were a rather classic way to kick off a pirate career. In fact, the very man who earned the King of the Pirates title you're shooting for, Henry Every, was notable for having started his career this way. With the aforementioned terrible conditions aboard law-abiding ships, wrangling up rap scallions for some captain stab and tomfoolery was a relatively easy task. But, just like a book club for amputees, you're never able to get everyone on the same page. It's high time you learn your lesson, boy. That's enough. Come on, Peter, it's time for a mutiny. Yeah! No, no, no. It's okay, you guys can go on without me. So, ten lashes, was it? Not all mutinies involve violence, however. For the bloodless ones, historians prefer to use the term lame. But regardless of style, what's really important here, Steve, is to make sure you're the one organizing the mutiny. Sure, it's a high-risk, high-reward tactic, but by leading a successful mutiny, you stand a pretty good chance of landing the role of pirate captain when all is said and done. And the high-risk? Details, details, Steve. Just keep your chin up because if you fail, a rope will do it for you. Now, how you carry out the mutiny will depend on the situation, but so long as you balance the equation of more men willing to stab the captain than defend them, odds are you'll end up successful and can focus on that pirate captain role. Okay, so maybe if I kill the most people and mutilate their bodies, the other pirates will see that and, and decide to follow me as captain. Damn, Steve, I didn't know you were a little freak like that. I mean, that's not my advice, but hey, if you got a little itch that needs scratching, have at it, king. No, okay, well, how do I be a pirate captain? Ah, uh -uh. getting a bit too close to CGP grade, 
there, bud. While fear can be a powerful motivator, pirate captains could be voted into and also out of the role at any time by the crew, making the use of it a losing strategy for them. So ironically, the gangs of violent criminals elected their leaders based more off respect rather than fear. So don't do crazy murder stuff. No, no, you can desecrate as many corpses as your little heart desires, Steve. All I'm saying is to make sure that when you're serving up severed toes to your victims like pigs in a blanket, make sure your fellow men know that they're in a safe space. F for them. Now, if you just follow this advice, Steve, the mutiny and subsequent captainship should come to you quite smoothly. Barring some rare hiccups, of course. Uh, rare hiccups? Oh, it's nothing, it's nothing. It's just, you know, being on a wooden sailboat and all, a mutiny can get rather messy if someone drops a torch, lights a fuse, or if there's a British Spitfire Mark 9 in the area. <laughs> oh, that's not good. What? There weren't fighter planes in the 1700s? There are when I need a sponsor segue. War Thunder is not only the most comprehensive vehicle combat game ever made, but it also rhymes with S'more Gunner, which I thought would look funny. With over 2,500 tanks, planes, helicopters, and ships, you'll have a grand old time unleashing your pent-up emotions with some of the most powerful war machines in history. Ranging from biplanes to fighter jets, War Thunder is packed with such immersive graphics and sound effects that you'll want to camp out by your mailbox, praying for the next draft. I personally rather fancy the damage x-ray view, as the only thing that fills me with more joy than pumping objects full of lead is knowing exactly how that lead breaks things. So join over 70 million players today for free on PC and console by using my link in the pinned comment or video description. New and returning players who haven't played in the last 6 months will also receive a bonus pack across all platforms with multiple premium vehicles, an exclusive vehicle decorator, 100,000 silver lions, and 7 days of premium account time. Alright, now that you've led a successful mutiny, gained your men's respect and been voted in as captain, you can get to work on building your reputation. These days, something like that's pretty easy. All you have to do is throw a few flags in your bio and make fun of Drake. But back in the day, you really had to work hard to build your rep. I see. So, so how do I build a reputation? Well, a little degenerate like you could always go the Lola Nay route. You know, hacking limbs, popping eyeballs, the works. I I'm sorry? Yeah, it's even said he cut out some dude's heart and took a bite of it once. H how would that even work? Well, a lot easier than you'd think, really. Once you shatter the sternum, you're really just a few snips away from a heart buffet. Not eating the heart. How would this work for helping me become a pirate king? <laughs> Why, for notoriety, of course. Aside from being my preferred source of protein, eating a man's heart does wonders for building infamy, which is perhaps the most important step towards your Pirate King journey. After all, the bigger the notoriety, the bigger the ships that surrender without a fight. Of course, there are ways to do this that didn't involve chowing down on a left ventricle. Blackbeard would stoke fear with wild hair full of lit fuses. Bartholomew Roberts exuded gallantry with vibrant clothes and a theatrical flair. And Dan Schneider built a false sense of safety by doing his best to look like John Candy. As you can see, Steve, each and every criminal worked hard to build their own unique brand that sent a strong message to their prey. Just an update on the branding progress, sir. Okay. Uh, Edward finished our new Jolly Rock. Roger. Uh -huh. Kyle's made us necklaces of severed ears. Sure. We've hit our quota of 25 burnt down ships this month. Okay, and where are we on the goose sculpture? The goose sculpture, sir? Correct, for the tippy top of the mast. I wasn't aware we needed a goose sculpture. Ah, okay. First day as an outlaw then. I've killed 11 people. You see, he's got an emergency a ship with a skull and crossbones. Well, that's just your run-of-the-mill pirates. They see a bunch of swords and cannons. Again, just pirates. No big deal. But when they see a giant goose sculpture, well, now they're not thinking just your average pirates. They're thinking these pirates are a bunch of silly geese. Holy shit. I... How does this help us? A regular pirate, you expect to torture you for not surrendering. That's boring, predictable, no big deal. But a silly goose pirate, well, who fucking knows what they'll do? They might bite your elbow, track mud all over your clothes, just fucking shit on your wall. We shit on their walls. I wouldn't know, Scott, we're silly geese. Point is, they don't know either. And when they see that goose coming, they'll cough up every last doubloon they have to not find out. Um, okay. One goose sculpture coming up then? Excellent, Scott. I'll go make our beak masks. Did you just hear our captain's stupid goose shit? This was his make-a-wish. The leukemia will take him in a week. Uh, oh my god, I had no idea. Ah, don't worry about it. Once he's gone, we can make a raccoon sculpture. What? <laughs> okay. First day as an outlaw then. Being a pirate means being a brand. One of terror, pain, and misery. It demands compliance and the promise of violence, save for those who avoid defiance. To build your rep is to build this brand, a daily PR that must be carefully planned. So with all this in mind and everything at hand, let's quiz you on scenarios to see where you land. You chase down a Spanish galleon that refused to surrender. After some back and forth cannon volleys, you boarded their ship and fought them into submission. Both sides have lost some good men, but you came out on top with a huge haul of barrels of wine and brandy. What do you do? Um, 
torture them for fighting back to send a message. Good, but far too lenient. I mean, wine and brandy? What kind of party is this without tequila? Better cut off their hands so they don't ruin the next function. You approach a British frigate that attempted to run to no avail. You board them without a fight and are now face to face with a cowering crew, surrendered and horrified. What do you do? Are they crying? Um... Some of them are, sure. I take the most composed man and slowly sever the tendons in his arms until the entire crew is crying. Jesus Christ, Steve! I'm supposed to be the fucked up one. Did I get it right? No. <laughs> Not at all. We want to encourage a surrender without a fight. You don't torture these poor sailors. Oh, my bad. Yeah, tell that to Mike's eight-year-old daughter. Anyway, third time's the charm. You sneak up on a French ship and raise your Jolly Roger. The terrified merchants quickly surrender without even the slightest fight or chase. You board their ship and they have all their cargo neatly lined up and cataloged for you. What do you do, Steve? I thank them and let them go? Oh, sorry, we were looking for torch the ship. But you just said to encourage surrender. Normally, yes, but these aren't your average sailors, Steve. Why don't you try again? Um, do we torch them because they're French? Steve! That's correct. While building your reputation will be hard work, the more effort you put in, the bigger the gains you'll realize. Kinda like training your muscles to failure. Oh boy, I bet I could do one more. <laughs> now that your brand is plaguing the world like Supreme in 2016, you can continue following the footsteps of modern day corporations and shift your focus to what's really important. Charity? That's right, Steve. And what better foundation to fund than our own pockets? So let's get to work on expansion. What truly made a pirate the stuff of legends was commanding not one, but multiple ships. When Henry ever he made off with the richest prize in pirate history, he flexed the command over six ships and 440 men. Expanding a pirate fleet might seem pretty straightforward. All you have to do is keep taking and taking until you got everything you want. While that might be easy for my ex-wife, stealing a bunch of ships is quite the risky feat and takes a lot more elbow grease than just hiring the best divorce lawyer on the eastern seaboard. Do you need to talk about- Nevertheless, this was the strategy pirates like Blackbeard would end up pursuing, while others, like Henry Every, put together their fleet more politically through mutual agreements with other pirate captains. But regardless of the growth strategy, what's really important is to make sure you whip up a pirate code. A pirate code was essentially a code of conduct with a sexier name. They detailed things like various rules, divisions of loot, and even injury compensation, all of which helped keep the savage sailors docile, like giving a preteen a prime. Alright gentlemen, our new pirate code is finished, so I need you all to listen up to the following articles. Number one, no man shall settle their quarrel with their fellow man via shooting or fisting of any kind. Number two, no man shall partake in gooning or munting. I I'm not quite sure what this is. It's important, keep it in. Right. <clears throat> uh, number three, all dining utensils shall be cleaned after use and the big purple bendy straw shall be reserved for Captain Rogers only. Oh. Hey, that's the rule, you that's the rule. Uh. Sure, you're able to wing it when you're just the pirate dirty dozen, but once you get more and more sailors under your command, you'll need a bit more structure to keep it all together. After all, it's practically expected that the group of malicious outlaws will eventually get out of line. So, just like with old game cartridges, you may need to blow on them every once in a while to keep things running smoothly. <sighs> Not again. You know what you have to do, William. Despite their depraved image, some captains would go as far as banning certain vices in their pirate codes to try to maintain a sense of order and composure amongst the crew. Bartholomew Roberts, for example, restricted his crew's gambling, drinking, and womanizing to make sure they stayed on top of their game. A set of morals that surely filled the pompous pirate with pride for living such a noble life, which ended in battles surrounded by his drunk crew. And now, Steve, we find ourselves at the final stop of your Pirate King Odyssey. Legacy. For legendary figures, the only thing more valuable than being successful is being remembered. Who is Tom Brady without Super Bowls, Adolf Hitler without invading polls, or Rick Astley without Rick Rolls? All these men, for better or for worse, will be remembered for generations for things like their massive impact on internet culture or mouth kissing their sons. As such, every king throughout their reign works hard to realize the multi-generational impact that will bolden their name in the pages of history. And so too shall you work, Steve, but luckily not in the Tom Brady boy kissing way. We aren't trying to be the King of Pop, after all. Luckily for you, much of what you've already accomplished has laid the foundation for your future legacy. All you need now is one crowning achievement to really get them historians foaming at the mouth. Take William Dampier, an English pirate, explorer, and naturalist whose expeditions led to many first discoveries for Europeans, including being the first person to pen the English words for avocado, chopsticks, barbecue, and subspecies, the last of which proved quite useful for scientists and scholars when defining the book talk community. While sporting impressive feats like first person to circumnavigate the world three times, 
times and first Englishman to explore Australia, he is perhaps most notable for being quite the foodie. Our little William loved to eat, so much so that over a hundred food-related words are credited to him in the Oxford English Dictionary, many of which are rather whimsical combinations of adjectives and nouns, like whistling duck or sucking fish. Being a naturalist, Dampier was captivated by wildlife and would write their descriptions with such exquisite and colorful detail that he inspired future generations of scientists and explorers. And then he'd eat them. Wow, what a vivid shade of red you have, Mr. Birdie. Must be some kind of heron-like waterfowl. <laughs> Such beauty. <laughs> what a plump little lad you are. I'd say you're no bigger than a duck, huh? Well, what do we have here? Throughout Dampier's expeditions, he would partake in the flesh of basically any animal he came across, and the cuter they were, the more eager he was. He ate manatees, Galapagos penguins, flamingo tongues, spin a wheel of Disney characters, and he's thrown that critter on the barbie. After finishing a three-course meal of sin, he'd review his experience in a journal one could mistake for a kitchen nightmare script. Hey, what are you doing with my stuff? I just be skimming a little journal here. That's private. Nonsense. They be your food reviews, no? I be only curious. Let's see, we got wallaby, shark, sea turtle... Say, what be this section on eating ass? You wrote about that? I'm a scientist, Jeremy! Dampier was such an iconic explorer that his seminal observations in the fields of zoology, navigation, and meteorology would go on to influence the likes of James Cook and Charles Darwin, proving, along with Mia Khalifa, that all it takes to go down in history is putting enough weird things in your mouth. Other pirates weren't scientists, however, and they had to make their name through other top achievements. Henry Every captured the Grand Mughal fleet in the most profitable act in pirate history until Johnny Depp stole the world's libido in 2003. Zheng Yatso amassed the world's largest pirate fleet of 60,000 men, which is still less than half as many diabolical fiends in one place as a BTS concert. Blackbeard blockaded Charlestown and looted all traffic into and out of the city, a strategy that would later be adopted by Apple's App Store. Bartholomew Roberts captured the most ships during the Golden Age with over 400 prizes, a feat so large no one would score more booty on the high seas until Epstein's Island. And Monkey D. Luffy has stretchy arms and punched a clown, I guess. I know a lot of you have been waiting for One Piece jokes, but I've only seen the live action. All of these grandiose acts were just the right flavor of notoriety to forever stencil their names into the books of history. Or manga. But if that's the case, why aren't they all known as Pirate Kings? That, my good little Steve, is because not all of them accomplished the most important act of a pirate career. Staying alive. Most pirates could find action, many could find riches, but what really made someone like Henry Every the king of the pirates was fighting a way out of it all, loaded and unscathed. With the vast majority of notable pirates ending up in either Davy Jones' locker or swinging like a knocker, this was a monumental feat only a few could boast to have achieved. The pirate life was a risky one, after all, and the longer you stayed in it, the greater your odds of suffering a horrible fate. For comparison, today we refer to this kind of risk as living in Florida. So sure, you could keep a low profile, stab a couple Spaniards, and leave slightly richer, but Mama didn't raise no bitch, Steve, and the only way to earn that king title is to make it big and make it out quick. So, how about it, Steve? Feel ready to chase that pirate crown? I think so. So do I just head on over to the Bahamas then? <laughs> oh, no, no, no. That's the haven for Instagram influencers now. These days you go to Somalia. Fuck. The golden age of piracy. 10 out of 10 stars. <laughs> you smell the tree? Yeah? <laughs> okay, only on one hand here. Someone's excited. Smell that? What's that? What's that? Can you sit for me? <laughs> Can you sit? Again, big thanks to War Thunder for sponsoring this video. Make sure to check it out for free on PC, Xbox, or PlayStation using my link in the description. New and returning players who haven't played in six months will receive a big old bonus pack of fun new toys across all platforms. But, just like your time on Earth, it's available for a limited time only, so check it out quick.